Gray nodes phenomenon is a common hand problem that often leads many to ask, is this normal? Gray nodes can vary from mild to severe to an isolated symptom to a marker of more severe disease and of course everything in between. I did a video a while ago covering gray nodes and what it is, the difference between primary and secondary gray nodes, and what we'll look out for as rheumatologists, so I definitely recommend checking that video out too. Today we're going to get into what we do about it what works, and what info you should take with a grain of salt. So let's get into it. I'm not going to go into too much detail here because like I said, I have a whole other video on it, but briefly, Raynaud's phenomenon is an over-exaggerated vascular event that results in poor blood flow to your limbs. When we are cold or stressed, our blood vessels in our limbs, so our hands, feet, and even our ears, nose, and nipples, will constrict. This diverts blood away from areas deemed not vital and directs it to the parts of our bodies we need to survive, like our heart and our brain. This is totally a normal reaction. However, with Raynaud's, this reaction is overdramatic. The blood vessels constrict too hard for too long and as a result of too little cold exposure. The result? Fingers, toes, ears, ears, noses, and nipples can become numb and turn white, then blue, and then finally red again when the blood comes back. The entire process can last about 5 to 20 minutes and can range from being uncomfortable to being downright painful, especially when the blood returns. So is Raynaud's normal? Well, I never say normal because honestly, who is normal? But it is certainly common. Depending on what study you're looking at, the incidence of Raynaud's amongst adults can be as high as 20% of the population. So why am I, a rheumatologist, talking about it? Well, Raynaud's phenomenon can often happen when someone has an autoimmune disease. Classically, we connect it with conditions like scleroderma, but it can happen in lupus, myositis, or vasculitis. But it is far more common for those with Raynaud's to have primary Raynaud's, meaning that they don't have an autoimmune disease. You've spoken to your doc, maybe you've even seen a specialist, and it's been confirmed you have Raynaud's. So now what? Well, thankfully, there is more you can do than, I hate to admit, our doctors often tell us. A lot of it starts at home with our lifestyle. So a biggie is going to be smoking. There are many components of cigarettes, including the nicotine, that can lead to vasoconstriction or constriction of the blood vessels, and that will lead to making Raynaud's worse. So quick story time. I have a friend who used to smoke and uh, she's a doctor. Obviously she knew she needed to quit and over time she slowly weaned herself off until she eventually stopped. Then maybe like four years later while in the midst of a big breakup, she texted me this pic of her hands and asked, is this normal? So as her friend, a rheumatologist, and someone known to be a little overdramatic myself, I immediately texted her no and then threw a slew of questions at her immediately wanting to rule out an autoimmune disease. All of her answers to my questions were no. And then it hit me, oh, she's smoking again. If you smoke and have Raynaud's, you could almost stop watching this video now because the thing you need to do is quit. Creams and pills and even infusions that I'm gonna talk about later won't have nearly as good of an effect if you're still smoking. She eventually quit again and her symptoms have gotten much better, although they aren't completely gone. So what other lifestyle factors affect Raynaud's? Well, stress is another big one. Stress management is key to controlling your Raynaud's. You also wanna be mindful of your caffeine intake and increase the amount of exercise that you get. Both of these recommendations are good for your overall health, but they can be especially helpful when you have Raynaud. Exercise promotes a healthy vascular system. Healthy meaning it's more in balance and not as prone to overreact and overconstrict. So those are things you can do to decrease the frequency and the severity of your Raynaud's attacks, but what about in the moment? Well, staying warm, keeping your hands, toes, or whatever part of you usually gets Raynaud's warm can keep Keep your blood vessels from constricting. Wearing gloves and doing what you can to avoid the cold is helpful. But often people need to add an extra layer and use hand warmers or protective clothing. I found that Raynaud's.org has excellent product resources and I'll put the link down in the description box below. So many of us are looking for non-prescription medication options, especially when we don't have something that we consider that severe, which is reasonable. Why slam something that is only bothersome with hard 
core medication. Isn't that overkill? Yeah, I get it. But when it comes to my nose, there are some interesting reports regarding different supplements. You know, it's tricky when putting something out on the internet regarding a recommendation, right? When speaking to YouTube, I always am trying to be as sound as possible when making statements about what works and what doesn't, which usually means there should be some solid evidence to it. Is there solid evidence proving a supplement will work in a vast majority of Raynaud's cases? No. But are there interesting options that may be worth a three month trial? Possibly. Omega-3 and evening primrose oil get a lot of attention for their abilities to open up blood vessels. However, just know that the two studies often mentioned are from the 80s and haven't been repeated. And they use really high doses of omega-3 that can lead to bleeding problems. Another popular ingredient is nitric oxide. Now, nitric oxide is involved in the maintenance of our circulatory system and all Although there are anecdotal reports of nitric oxide supplementation that help, there's been no evidence that would support putting everyone with Raynaud's on this. My recommendation would be to discuss the risk benefit ratio of trying one of these with your doctor. My general feeling about supplements is as long as you're going into it with eyes wide open, knowing there are no guarantees and ensuring it doesn't interfere with any of the other medications you're taking, then giving it a three month trial may be worth it. Nothing, however, replaces the various lifestyle changes like stopping smoking, improving your stress management, keeping warm, decreasing your caffeine, and getting enough exercise. Okay, so it's time for medication. So you've tried all the things and it's still bothering you. It may be time for a prescription. Just like with everything else, we want to start with something that will have the least chance of a side effect and give us the biggest bang for our buck. So we start with topicals like creams and ointments. Nitroglycerin, which you may recognize as something people take when they have chest pain, can come in an ointment form and when applied to the hand and fingers can open up blood vessels. Nitro ointment allows us to spare the rest of our body from the dilating effects and instead put it directly where we need it. This can be pretty effective and I usually recommend anyone with Raynaud's to have this in their medicine cabinet just in case. Once someone has tried topicals and still needs more help, then we move to the oral medication, the pill. Nifedipine is going to be our go-to medicine. It is in a class of blood pressure medications that we call calcium channel blocker. It works on the smooth muscle layer that surrounds our blood vessels. This smooth muscle will contract, which then leads to the blood vessel constricting. By interfering with the muscle's ability to contract, the vessels will then not constrict. In fact, they'll dilate. This will lower blood pressure, but will also help with Raynaud. About a third of people who use it do find relief, and going up on the dose tends to squeeze more juice out of this medication fruit. And just FYI, nifedipine can also be made into an ointment. So if you find that you can't tolerate it because it lowers your blood pressure too much, it may be worth asking if you can get it in ointment form. This medication usually has to be made special through a compounding pharmacy and is likely not going to be covered by insurance. So make sure to ask about costs. We will also use medications originally developed for erectile dysfunction like Viagra and Cialis. These medications help ED by opening up blood vessels and lo and behold, they work for Raynaud's too. I also wanna mention the use of Botox. This is a reasonably new addition to our toolbox and one that's promising. The data is somewhat mixed and the studies showing positive results are small. It's also important to note that because it's new, there's not yet a standardized way to do it. Meaning there's no consensus on where to inject, how much medication to inject and how frequently to do it. That being said, if you have tried most of the available options and you're still suffering and there's reason to be concerned that your brain nose could become severe, which we're going to talk about next, then it's worth looking into. Given the questions we still have about Botox, however, I would definitely make sure that the person doing it is experienced. This is most likely not going to be your rheumatologist, but likely a hand surgeon or perhaps even a pain management specialist. When having a consult regarding getting this procedure done, I would definitely ask how many they've done and what their success rate is. Occasionally, Raynaud's phenomenon can become severe. Thankfully, this is the exception rather than the rule, and mostly in those with Raynaud's that is part of an autoimmune condition. So what does severe Raynaud's mean? It means that the digits go such a long time without adequate blood flow that the tissue suffers and it starts to break down. 
This can start as little divots or ulcers at the tip of our fingers and toes, and it can progress to where we eventually lose those fingers and toes. Again, this is rare, but as you can imagine, something that needs to be taken seriously. And this is usually in cases where there's an autoimmune condition. So treating the underlying condition is key, although to be honest, not particularly helpful for severe renos. Giving high doses of prednisone, biologic therapies, or even chemotherapy for an autoimmune condition is usually not enough to open up the blood vessels and get blood back to that digit and save it. In these kinds of cases, we bring out the big guns of vasodilators and we'll usually elicit the help of our friendly neighborhood surgeon, so our hand and vascular surgeons. There are IV medications that are given over a span of several days that can really open up blood vessels. These medications are not necessarily easy to get your hands on as they can often require a prior authorization here in the U.S., but when they're necessary, they are helpful. In severe cases, you may also find yourself discussing a sympathectomy with a hand surgeon. This is a procedure where they cut the tiny nerves that feed into the fingertip blood vessel. Without those nerves, the blood vessels can't constrict and thus the blood keeps flowing. This can be helpful, but it's not as clear cut as I just made it sound and doesn't always work and usually doesn't last forever. So what are some questions you should ask yourself and your doctor regarding next steps for your Raynaud's? Are you doing everything you can in your lifestyle to support healthy blood flow and reduce your overdramatic blood vessel constriction? If you smoke, do you have a plan and someone to hold you accountable to quit? How are you managing stress? What can you do to improve? Do you have appropriate gloves and warm clothing. Do you carry them with you or do you oftentimes find yourself without them? Say you left them at home or in the car and now find yourself in a strongly air-conditioned building. Have you discussed your renos with your doctor and do you have a plan for medication? This is not something you should set and forget. You need to make sure you have a follow-up schedule to discuss how the medication's going. Far too often we just prescribe a medication and say see you back in six months. Adjusting the dose or switching to another medication can squeeze more juice out of that medicine. So you don't want to sit on it for too long. Maybe this doesn't mean you need a full appointment. Can you set up a telemedicine appointment? Or can you agree on a patient portal communication within a given time frame? Whatever works best for you and your doc in their office, the point is stay on top of this. I hope you all found this helpful. Like I said, I have a whole other video on my notes where I go into more detail about primary and secondary Raynaud's. So check that out in the description box. As always, if you've got something out of this, please like, share, and subscribe and we'll see you next time.